Welcome to Cowboys on the Couch by Life Stance Health, where each episode covers the many facets of mental health and well being. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicolette Lianza, and on today's episode of Cowboys on the Couch, I'll be talking with Amanda Pearson about the potential negative effects of social media. So welcome, Amanda. Great to have you on. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Nikki. Studies have shown that social media use can have some negative effects on users' mental health. And so I'm looking forward to our conversation today, Amanda, as we dive deeper into this topic. So let's jump in. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. So yeah, my name is Amanda Pearson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist with Life Stance Health. I primarily work with couples, teens, men's mental health, women, anxiety, ADHD. I have a beautiful landscape of clients that I see, which I absolutely love. Beyond this, I live and work in Chicago, Illinois. I love exploring my city, traveling. I'm a major foodie, love trying different workout classes and events throughout the city. And in addition to this, in the last year, I've started personally using social media to expand professionally, which has been so much fun and a big learning curve. Great, great. Thank you. So how can social media negatively affect people's mental health, relationships, and overall well-being? Big question, for sure. And let me start with this. Social media can be an incredible tool and lovely connective tissue when it's used in healthy ways. And if you've been using social media for a while, you've probably noticed that it's become more and more ad-centric. Everyone seems to be an influencer, which means there's more opportunity for profit. Mm -hmm. There's literally a study called neuro, a field of study called neuromarketing that learns and understands how the consumer brain works to profit more, right? It's literally capitalism in a nutshell. So there's that. And also quick style videos like TikToks or Instagram reels activate our brain's reward system, signaling our dopamine, which is why it can be incredibly hard to get off of social media or when you find yourself unconsciously like gravitating towards TikTok or Instagram or certain apps when you're depleted or even bored or stressed out. And as a therapist and even as an individual, we could see an increase in our anxiety and depressive symptoms from the overuse of social media. So this is over scrolling copious amounts of time stagnant or indoors or in that comparison trap, right? I always say comparison is a thief of joy. And it's important to remember this before comparing your body, your relationships, your accomplishments, et cetera, to another person's highlight reel. We are all very multifaceted beings with various levels of hardship in our lives. And I think we need to remember this even when we're scrolling the beauty of media. I agree. I love that you said that a comparison is the thief of joy. So true. And social media definitely feeds into that. Definitely. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. so how can social media specifically affect, you know, certain populations like men's mental health or teens, populations like that? Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about men's mental health because it's not often amplified, mm -hmm. but it's increasingly become a highly scrutinized group in our society. And just some stats, men make up 49% of our population, but 80% of all suicides. And men are also the most lethal in attempts. With this, one in six men also experience sexual assault, which is highly underreported right. because of societally created deficits, right? Men aren't supposed to show weakness or emotions or cry or supposed to be a man, be tough, which clearly translates, obviously translates into difficulties within relationships, hardship, getting vulnerable in romantic relationships, difficulty leaning on support systems, even male to male relationships, venting about the hardships of life doesn't often happen as frequently as women or other populations. And emotions come out one way or another. So either you have the tools to cope with the range of human emotions we experience, or it might come out in expressions like aggression substance use, passive aggressive comments, blow ups, illness, et cetera. So this is a very dangerous loop that I think social media amplifies and shrinks opportunity for men. And as for teens, the adolescent brain is not fully developed. There's a deep importance for teens with social perceptions. We want a social reward like attention or approval from our peers when we're teens. 
So nowadays, teens go online to make that connection and they're more and more vulnerable and sometimes even exploited by social media, trends, ads, cyberbullying, right. et cetera. And teens often experience deeper feelings of fear and anger, depression, aggression, impulsivity than adults because of their brain development. So men and teens can get a bad rep on social media as larger groups in our society. But I think it's important for us to remember that both groups are human, vulnerable, and can't control their age or how they were born. So I think it's important for us to uplift and support and be an ally to all groups and avoid jumping into that echo chamber that brings them down, like drinking out of a mug that says men's tears or hating on teens, things like right. that. No, good advice there for sure. Thank you. How can we promote healthier expectations of dating and relationships on social media? Yes. First, I think normalizing how multifaceted and difficult relationships can be is a great place to start. Every relationship's a bit different due to various components and lived experiences. There's no one size fits all for the perfect relationship. And when we're on social media, it seems like everyone's in a happy relationship with no conflict mm -hmm. and just living in sunshine and rainbows. But conflict is natural. Of yep. course, we want it to be kind and clean and fair. It's not always beauty. We, we, we have to have that conflict to gain deeper understanding to grow as couples. And an example of this that I've seen on social media lately is just trend. If he wanted to, he would. I think that could go for any gender, sexuality, anything like that. But in relationships, it is our job to assertively communicate our wants, our needs, our expectations. Mm -hmm. Our partners are not mind readers, right. unfortunately. And we all love a little bit differently. We have different childhoods, different triggers, different love languages, and romance can take some learning and unlearning to master. It's constant growth. I think really showing this on social media could be a tool, right? Knowing that it's not always so lovely right. and maybe learning right. some tools for conflict resolution is great. Even just dipping into our relationships using I statements, right? I feel hurt when mm -hmm. blank. I want, I need, right? It takes the blame off of the other partner and we're owning our own emotions and experiences and needs. It's a big tool. And also just being kinder on social media. Right. If you wanted to, we would all the way to like beige flags, right? Beige flags aren't even like these red flags that are right, actually right. like toxic or unhealthy <laughs> or disturbing. Like actually watch out. It's usually like making fun of how a man swims or rides a horse or how he has toes. And I think we just need to let people be a little bit more weird and human and celebrate mm -hmm. the different types of relationships and ups and downs that we all experience within them. Definitely, definitely. How does social media feed into the negative and positive impacts of labeling, especially in the context of mental health? Yes. So in my office, social media is referred to almost daily. I bet you experience this as well. Yes, definitely. A positive lens it, it increases awareness and access to new information and concepts and perspectives. And I typically am with a client for one hour out of their 168 hour week, I think. So there's a lot that can unfold outside of that hour. And if a TikTok or an Instagram post can fuel a larger discussion to gain deeper understanding about a client and how they interact with these concepts, I think that could be a really beautiful dialogue. On the other hand, there is some negative impacts of the labeling because there's lots of self-diagnosing, lots of misdiagnosing. It often leads to also people to overanalyze and mm -hmm. get some obsessive or restrictive or even ruminating thoughts, which can be harmful. And it's coming from often an out-of-pocket post from a stranger. So I think we need to be very careful with what we post, even as professionals. I try to be very cautious and understand maybe how this will land for different populations or experiences but also understanding that what we consume can be critically thought about in different ways. Social media is not therapy by any means, even if it's a therapist behind that screen. So I definitely think bringing it to your clinician is a beautiful thing. Having a nuanced conversation, yes. not assuming yeah. that's our label. Right? I think that's the key thing to emphasize, coming forward with it for a conversation, a bigger conversation about it. Very important. Yes, absolutely. What are some things people can do to protect themselves from social media misinformation, especially about mental health? Yeah. 
I think the first thing, again, is just to critically think. Allow yourself to question, open-ended question what's going on here, right? Thinking it through what we're being influenced and advertised, right? Being willing to do our own research. There's lots of beautiful research that's clinical in nature out there that we can get to if we just hop off social media and hop onto a Google Scholar, right? So I think consulting a licensed clinician or doctor when it comes to your mental or physical health is also vital. Um, also following reputable sources on social media mm -hmm. and creating boundaries. I think this is really threefold. There's three pieces of boundaries that I recommend when it comes to social media. One is limits. And maybe you're great with boundaries with yourself and you're like 15 minutes on, on TikTok today and that's it. And you listen to yourself and that's great. But if this doesn't work and it doesn't work for all of us, our phones have in the settings different options to go in and set limits. You can ask yourself, how much time am I willing to give TikTok and Instagram today? Mm -hmm. And you could set that limit. And I think this is also a great tool for parents mm -hmm. to use with your kids, right? You can model this for them. You can do it together. It can be a great activity to deep think about how we want to use social media in healthy ways. Number two is to unfollow accounts that don't serve you. Avoiding triggers. That's if something's upsetting you, just remove it. There, mm -hmm. It's not worth it, right? This is, it's all fake, right? So right. I think remembering that you can just let go is mm -hmm. a way to protect your peace sometimes. And three is using your algorithm like it uses you. <laughs> yes, good way so, to put that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in on Instagram, a big tool that I'll share is in that top left corner on Instagram, you could click it and press following instead of just that natural feed. That removes all the ads, all the influencing, and it's really just who you're following. Mm -hmm. So if you're following step two, which is unfollowing accounts that don't serve you, this is a nice feed of things that kind of lift you up for catching up with your social group or learning about things that you're interested in. And same thing on TikTok. If your algorithm's in a, a weird funk, I know I've been there and you don't want it to be there anymore. You actually have more control than you yeah. think. One tool here is going to the bottom, like you're going to send someone to TikTok, that little arrow, and you can press not interested. And this naturally resets your algorithm that gets rid of those videos, whether it was some hard trip mm -hmm. or it's not a healthy mindset for you to be in, or you're noticing that TikTok's become a darker, scary place, right? That's a way to edit it to make it more aligned with what you're hoping to gain from these social medias. Oh my gosh. Amanda, those are great tips. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other takeaways you'd like to share? Yeah, going with what you can do to protect yourself from misinformation about mental health and just the impacts of social media is to really notice how you're feeling before and after using social media. You can't hate yourself into a version of yourself that you love. And I think if you find yourself in that comparison trap, that's not always the healthiest space for us to be in. And just considering the impacts, if you can't naturally think this through. There's great apps like How We Feel app. It's a mood meter app where you can collect data on your emotions and energy levels. And I think it'll be really interesting to see, especially after spending even 30 minutes on TikTok, if that's how wind down at night, mm -hmm. how are you feeling before and after that, right? Another thing is there is no right timeline. I think we need to be really careful of the traps that social media and capitalism set us up for. That's a part of that comparison, but we always seem to feel like we're behind or not catching up or not doing enough. And I think that's something else that we can be a little bit more critically thoughtful about because mm -hmm. it's unfair and right. it always has us feeling behind. Right. And lastly, just be kind to all populations. We never really know the impact right. of what we say and what we post and it's out there forever. I remember hearing that as a teen. And as my mom taught me, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all, whether it's a post or a comment or even just gossip about a random celebrity. It's, if it's not nice, we don't need to say it, right? We can make social media a much more gentle and yes. fulfilling place if we do all work together to be kinder. All right, great. Oh my gosh. Great way to wind down our time talking about this topic. Just all of us just be a little kinder. Definitely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So thank you, Amanda, for sharing your insights with us today. I'm sure many people, many of our listeners, we're going to take quite a few of your suggestions and hopefully put those to actually doing them to commit their own potential negative effects of social media. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And of course, if anyone does want to follow along on my social media journey, 
I am on Instagram and TikTok at Resilient Social Work. And I also have some more in-depth blogs on WordPress that are in my bios and things like that. So thanks for tuning in and thanks for following in advance. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the team behind the podcast, Jason Clayton, Juliana Whitten, and Chris Kelman, with a special thanks to Jason Clayton, who edits our episodes. Thank you for listening to Congress on the Couch. Take care, everyone. Thank you.